Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Episode 79 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Oh my goodness, what a special episode we have. Uh, It's a little longer than usual, but it's totally worth it. It's longer because I was so enthralled speaking with my guest today, E.E. Burke. She's a historical and contemporary romance author. And oh my gosh, believe me when I tell you, you are in for one lovely reading. So stay tuned for that. I'm not going to waste any time talking about other things. I'm just going to recommend that you go ahead and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We're also on YouTube. We're on just about every podcast platform out there, so make sure you click that subscribe button so you don't miss out each week with a new episode. If you want to connect with me and let me know of an author recommendation, somebody that you'd like to have on the show, or maybe you yourself are an author with a finished book, well then reach out to me through email. It is samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com, and uh, just let me know and we'll set something up. As always, I want to thank our longtime sponsor, U-Storal, out of Warrensburg, Missouri. If you're looking for the best in self-storage, you need to look no further than ustorall.net. They have climate control and non-climate control. You know, every security feature you could think of to keep your belongings safe while they're in storage, they have it there. And as if that wasn't enough, they use LED lighting and solar power. So they're keeping their carbon footprint as small as possible to help the environment. So check them out online at ustoral.net. That is spelled the letter U-S-T-O-R-A-L-L dot net. I also want to thank our very special sponsor, Scrivener. Wow, try to say that three times fast. I, I just, I love this service. I love writing my stories on there. I know you're, you're going to love it too. So make sure you check them out. Click the link in the show notes so you can go to Scrivener. It is the absolute best in writing software. It is made for writers by writers. Don't forget to also use code CHAPTER when you go to check out, and you're going to save yourself 20% off your desktop order. And I just want to give a big shout out to my friends over at the Pop Goes the Culture Network. They share this episode along with the episodes of oh, about a dozen or more other podcasts. Fantastic stuff. Check them out online. So many good things to do. So many good things to discover. And I I am so happy to uh, have a home with them. And I definitely recommend you check out some of the other awesome shows over there at Pop Goes the Culture Network. Click the links to find out more. So, like I said, our guest this week is historical and contemporary romance author E.E. Burke. Uh, I was really excited to find out this was her first ever chapter reading, which I you would not guess that. Like, I barely had to do any editing at all. So, I mean, she does an astounding job. We talk about getting into character heads, how much she loves doing research. And like I said, this is going to be a little bit longer than usual because it's so fascinating. And the chapter comes at you from three different character point of views. And, And she breaks it up for you so you know when it's coming, but... Amazing stuff. Really, really cool. And I I loved it. it. During editing, I was listening to it multiple times. Uh, not because of errors, but because I was just like, oh my gosh, what did she just say? It was it was awesome. I loved it. And uh, <laughs> you're gonna you're going to love hearing her grandfather clock chiming in the background once in a while. I couldn't really edit that out, but you know, I thought it was a nice touch. It was a, a lovely little thing about her reading. It's, it's really homey, and I, I liked it. But I do want to apologize, too, if you hear any of my occasional coughing in the background. This was recorded uh, a little over a month ago, early, early July, and I was dealing with that uh, really bad cold at the time. So hopefully I've got most of it out, but I think there was uh, one or two that I couldn't quite get out because it was happening while she was talking. So I apologize. Colds happen, and yeah, they suck. (laughs) Enough of that. Let's get on over to a word from our sponsor and then our incredible interview with E.E. Burke. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, 
Project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard. You can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener writing software, built by writers for writers. And welcome back, everybody, to another exciting episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This week, I am I'm really, really stoked because this is a new friend of mine that I met at a, uh, at a recent writing uh, workshop that my writing group had. And I, it, this is really, really cool because I love it whenever I get to have a romance author on. And her books are incredibly well written and so beautiful. I guess would be the best way to put it. Her books have been in the Kindle Top 100 and a semi-finalist for Kindle Book Awards. She's been a DJ, a journalist, and an advertising executive. I am talking about award-winning author E.E. E. Burke. Miss Burke, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm so happy to have you here, and I'm so happy we finally got to work this out. So with our crazy schedules that we both have. Yeah, definitely. I am too. Did you have a good uh, 4th of July? Oh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. We uh, spent a lot of time out by the water and uh, that's pretty much all we've been doing this whole month is either on the creek or on the lake or, you know, somewhere we were, where we can be in front of water. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> now, being as that uh, we're both in Missouri, so I, I was interested when you said creek because I know yeah. sometimes we get told, no, it's creek, but <laughs> you like to say creek. I like to say creek. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would depend on which side of the family I'm talking to on which way I need to say it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, where I, where I grew up, uh, it was uh, actually, we didn't even use the word creek. In Florida, we called them streams. So oh, yes. out in Missouri, they call them creeks. Yes. I remember many a summer growing up where that was my that that's what that was the fun thing that was our facebook we go out into the creek and have fun at, in our so-called pool and socialize with friends and uh, just hang out and every once in a while you might catch something that frog or a turtle or something else in there or a salamander or, or salamander a, a yeah or yeah yeah we, <laughs> yeah, we, we do uh, the kids do that that has been a highlight of my children's life um has going down to Southern Missouri where their grandparents grew up and, you know, hanging out on the old farm and going down to the creek. And that's just a highlight of their life. So uh, it's been really a pleasure to do that with them. <laughs> so now for some reason that when it comes to being an author, I'm thinking, yeah, a journalist, advertising executive, I can see all that, but a DJ that was, <laughs> that intrigued me. Tell us a little bit about that. That was in my college days, um, and I was, uh, at the time, I was majoring in journalism, but we had a radio, TV, film group that that I just kind of, I was intrigued by that, and a friend of mine had gotten a job locally at a radio station, and I said, well, that sounds cool, that sounds like fun, so she said, they need another person, and I was like, yeah, okay, I'll be a DJ. So I went down and applied and they hired me and, and I worked, I worked the uh, red eye shift, the overnight shift. And I went by the name Jamie Lawrence, not a name <laughs> I made up. That was a name they made up. And, uh, and I was a top 40 disc jockey for about two years while I was at college. And, you know, it was fun in some ways, in some ways it was nuts. I can't imagine doing that now because I would work pretty much all night, come mm. home, shower, you know, go to class and then come home and collapse. Mm -hmm. And it, it was quite the, the schedule trying to, trying to keep that up. But I was crazy enough and young enough I could pull it off. But it was a lot of fun. And there are a lot of stories. Many I can't tell over the air. <laughs> They're a little strange. There are some weird people out in the middle of the night is all I'm going to say. Oh, yes, yes. Now, and what, what's really cool about that and something I have in common with you on that is, so you, you kind of went into that without any experience. I did. I did. That's what I did when I became a, a disc jockey at a nightclub. I had been doing some odd jobs for the place right after I got out of the military, and they lost a disc jockey, and they were, said they were going to be looking for one. And I went, oh, I can do that. Yeah, I used to DJ when I was in the military. And they were like, oh, great. Okay, yeah, you can do that. So I made sure to show up a couple hours early to try and familiarize myself and figure out what in the world I'm doing because I had no clue. 
And I just totally BS my way into that position for about the same. It was like two years where I did that. And it, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, I don't think I could go back. I, I don't think yeah. I could handle today's music. Well, that was back in the 70s when I was a DJ. And it, I think uh, me and the other girl, we shared that late shift. We were the first female disc jockeys in Waco, Texas. Oh, wow. <laughs> So we were kind of a kind of an oddity and people tended to drop by and and you know want to look at us and talk to us and uh it it, it was kind of odd <laughs> so oh, we just wow. phone calls you know so now going from the dj you you completed your degree how long before you began uh writing your romance stories wow okay so my writing uh, from the standpoint of being a fiction author didn't really get going till about 10 years ago. I worked in journalism and marketing and PR and advertising. I did a lot of, you know, other things. And the type of writing I was doing was really different. It was not fiction. Mm. Uh, but I always wanted to write fiction. I just, I had wanted to do that from the time, you know, I was in high school. Mm -hmm. But I just didn't think I could for whatever reason, I just didn't feel like I could do it, uh, that I could, you know, make a living at it or make a go at it or whatever, or that I had the time. I always wanted to write a book, you know. So finally, I, you know, kind of hit a point in my life where I said, man, you know, I either got to get this book written or die without ever doing it. So <laughs> <you know? laughs> I said, I, I'm just going to do this because it, it was a good time for me to leave that career behind you know the family situation was such that it was just going to be easier if I wasn't working at a job away traveling all the time which is what I was doing mm. uh, and so I thought you know I think I'm gonna just I'm just gonna chill at home I'm gonna work from home do part-time consulting and work on this book and so I did I just started writing and as for romance and and why romance well I, I write historical romance, and the, and I say historical and emphasize that. I'm a history geek. I love history, uh, <laughs> but I'm also a sucker for a good love story. So I put those two things together. I read tons of historical romance over the years. I've probably been through grocery bag after grocery bag full of books. <laughs> Uh, and just really loved the the combination of the historical and the romantic story. So I thought, well, you know, I might as well write what I love. So I dug into some historical and, and began to work on a book. And I most of my books are set in the American West uh, because I kind of love that place. I love that era. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by it. And I just decided I would, you know, write some stories set in that period. And uh, because I'm here in Kansas and I can do the research and, and you know, kind of look at the area. It's a very historical area here mm -hmm. in the Missouri, Kansas area. And I thought, well, you know, I'll set my, a lot of my books out here because there's a lot of history out here. It's very interesting history. And it was considered the West back in the day. So a lot of my books are set in this very area that I live. So you've just been doing this for around 10 years, but you've got at least 15 books from what I can see here. And I mean, that that's pretty active. Yeah, I've been, I've been pretty prolific once I got going, although I know other people who've been at it 10 years and have twice the number of books I do. But um, I, you know, for me that, that has been a good, it's, it's been pretty prolific. I'm not a fast writer, uh, but I'm, but I'm a prolific writer and I write, all the time. So uh, there isn't many days ever go by that I don't write something. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way I've been able to complete those books is just kind of heads down and keeping at it. Yeah. Now uh, at the event, I won one of your, uh, it's one of the, uh, the train books with the Christmas cover on it. Oh yeah. Here. Yeah. The, um, uh, it was probably the American Mail Order Brides Christmas Collection. Yeah, there it is. Yep. I got your, yeah, the American Christmas collection. Yep. So I got uh, one of those, which, and, and we were talking about later on that that was the one I got. And I, I, I'm excited about it. I love getting to read different things. And this show has certainly opened that up to me to read things outside of what I would normally read. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to opening this up and, and diving into it because it looks, it looks really great. Well, good. I'm glad. That's actually the collection that did really, really well on Amazon. Uh, it just 
you know, I guess it just kind of sparked something and it, it did really well. I was kind of surprised and then I was elated. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the headline on here is two brides, three wishes and a Christmas miracle. So, yeah. uh, you know, that it sounds, it's a lot better than some of the blood and guts <laughs> that, uh, and other stuff that I've read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now I'm working on something entirely different. Um, I always love to kind of shift gears and do different stuff. And, you know, I, I, I enjoyed writing books that kind of uh, took on that mail order bride trope. That was fun. And it's, it's very popular still in historical romance. But then I, you know, I've always been a big fan of Mark Twain. And he, it's just his books, his his writing, his his wit, his turn of phrase. Two of my favorite books growing up were Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. And I just didn't, you know, I, I, I never knew what happened to them. And I always wanted to know what happened to them. And finally, you know, after I'd written my, you know, probably about 10 books or so, I thought, well, I, I think I'm just going to write what happens to them because I want to know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so I jumped into that. And these books are a little different even than the ones that, that you won. Uh, they're, uh, they're more historical. They're, they've got a lot more history in them. Uh, they are romantic, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them on the shelf historical romance. They're, they're just a little different. Derivative fiction is one way of looking at them. Yeah, and we're talking about uh, your your latest one here, Taming Huck Finn. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I'm just noticing the release date. So that was about the time I actually read Huck Finn for my first time. Oh, wow. I, I okay. don't remember getting to read that in school. Or if we did, I think I just kind of you know gleaned over it. I didn't really read it. So, but yeah, uh, about uh, the same time last year, I finally uh, got to read Huck Finn. And yeah, I, I loved it. It's interesting that that would come at the same time. Probably means nothing, but I, I find it interesting. Uh, but <laughs> Maybe it means something. It might be kind of a sign. I don't know. I think it's a sign I need to pick this up and see what's yeah. going on with Huck. That's right. <laughs> so, and, and this is really cool that you, and, and I got already got a little bit of a look into this at the workshop because you use this as an example of some of your characterizations. Mm -hmm. which I just loved. You did an amazing job with this. Tell us, like, what can we expect? Because this is the book we're going to be hearing from today. Am I correct? Right, right. This is the book. Yes. Yeah. So t tell the audience a little bit about what we can expect today from, or what they can expect from picking up Taming Huck Finn. Okay. So the... <laughs> the impetus of writing this book, really, as I began to think about uh, the adult Huck Finn, and, and really, this was the first of the two books that, that I conceived. I, I got to thinking, you know, whatever happened to him? You know, where did he end up? At the end of Mark Twain's book, Huck is done with being civilized by, by Mrs. Douglas and, and, her, and her sister, Miss Watson. And he's, he's fed up with it. He does not want to be civilized. So he takes off for the territory. And that's really kind of how the book ends. He sets out for the territory. So the book that I wrote opens up uh, about 15 years later, and Huck has indeed set out for the territory. He's gone and done all kinds of things. He's gone gold, you know, gold mining, and he's, you know, he's, he's worked up and down the river, but he's worked his way up to being a steamboat pilot, and that just seemed to make sense to me. Huck loves the river. You know, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be taken away from it. So what would he do as a job if he had a job? And I thought, steamboat pilot, of course. What else would he do? That, that just makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought, well, okay, so Huck's a steamboat pilot. He's single. He's footloose and fancy free. He's living the life that he wants to live his, you know, on his own terms. What's, they always say, you know, with a book, you know, you got to have a lot of conflict in fiction, right? So I'm like, okay. We need conflict. You know, what happens to him? Well, what's the worst thing that could happen to him? Well, he wakes up one day and voila, he's suddenly in charge of a child. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he has responsibility. And then I thought, well, okay, so he's got responsibility for this orphan boy. What's the next worst thing that could happen to him? He has responsibility for a child. And then all of a sudden, this woman shows up claiming the child for her own and insisting that he turn the child over. And she reminds him of old Miss Watson. And he can't possibly turn a child over to old, 
to the you know reincarnation of old Miss Watson, she'd make the child's life a misery. <laughs> and so, and so there you have it. That was the impetus for writing this book because it was all about Huck. Really, you know, he he is very much footloose and fancy free. He loves his freedom, but he longs to belong. He longs for a sense of a place to belong and people to belong to. And he does not know how to find it. And so through the course of this book, uh, you know, Huck finds his home, but it takes him a long time to find it. And boy, does he fight it. So that's, that's kind of how this book came about. That's where it came from. <laughs> and that's what you'll find when you pick it up is, is that story of Huck finding his way home, finding his, finding his greatest adventure, if you will. The log line is his greatest adventure is about to catch up with him. <laughs> oh, sounds amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> so how was it diving into such iconic characters and getting into their heads? Did you, have any kind of struggles with that? You know, the way I did it was, well, one, I reread uh, the books again. I reread Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn actually many times. I didn't only do that, reread them. I read a lot about how Mark Twain wrote them and what he was thinking about and, you know, kind of where a lot of them came from and, and the background of the time and the era and the place and, and everything he was writing about and where all that was coming from. So I did a ton of research. Re research is my playground. I love, love research. It is joy to me. It is so exciting. People go, what? You love research? Yes, I do. I love it. I love reading all these stories and books and history and all this stuff and just finding all these amazing things. And so I researched a lot. I researched a lot about uh, Twain, the characters, the books, and I began to research about the era and about steamboats and about the Missouri River. And what was the difference between the Missouri and the Mississippi? And there was a big difference. And I learned a lot about, you know, steamboating and steamboating on the Missouri and what, would the, what was the Missouri like at that time before it got dredged? You know, it was a big, wide, wild, crazy river that not many people would dare to pilot a steamboat on, especially up in the upper Missouri River as you head toward Montana. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, you know, it just, made, it just made perfect sense to me that Huck, would be a, a pilot on the Missouri River, on the on the Big Muddy, on the wild Missouri. Mm -hmm. That just made sense to me. Of course, he would take on that river. The yeah. Mississippi, Mississippi would be too tame for him. You know? Yeah, but kind of a been there, done that already. Yeah, this is yeah exactly. The new adventures of Huck Finn almost. Really, exactly. <laughs> so. So yeah, and so that's kind of how I got into their minds and, and I read diaries of steamboat pilots and um, I just kind of sank in to all that research and put myself into that period and into that era and into those characters' minds. I, I just, I just kind of become part of the story and that's how I write. Okay. Now, and, and this is kind of a little bit of a departure from your romance. Do you find that this is something that you may stick with for a while? Do you look at a, maybe a sequel or another, maybe another historical figure? Yeah, I, well, I've got this Huck Finn book, and then I will have um, Tom Sawyer Returns as the, the yeah. next book out in this collection. Uh, and right now, um, those are the two books that I actually have written. I'm working on Tom Sawyer Returns now. I'm finishing it up and doing revisions. But um, I have an idea of a few other books that could actually be added to this series if it takes off and if it looks like it's something people want. I'm certainly open to that. These are, they are romantic in terms of there are, you know, there are love stories involved, but there's a ton of history in them too. And, and what I've found is that people who really like the Mark Twain characters have, it scared me a little, but honestly, those are the people that have enjoyed this the most. They're like, oh, I always want to know what happened to these guys. And this is great. I love it. I love how you did it. I love how you wove in the old story. I love how you picked up on bits and pieces and how there are all these great little Easter eggs in there, you know, from the old books. And, you know, so they love and appreciate it. And I was really happy to hear that because that's like, that was what I was aiming for. <laughs> 
Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to uh, hear about when those come out and uh, see where else you go with this. Yeah. Uh, going back over your library of the uh, the romance books, uh, one of the things I found really, really interesting is, and something I guess I, like I said, romance is kind of outside my realm. It's not something I really read into. So it, I found it really interesting to see, okay, here is, Here's a Victoria Bride of Kansas book 34. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's, that's now she's got 15 books. How is that right? And then I'm realizing you're writing into another series. Now yeah. that's really interesting to me. How do you, how did you get involved with that? Okay. So that was the first time I got involved in a multi-author project and it was the biggest one I've ever been involved in. And it was not conceived by me. I was asked to be part of it by the person who did conceive it, Kirsten Osborne. You know, basically she imagined writing this multi-author series of mail order brides, one from every state. And it was a brilliant idea. I told her, I'm, I'm, I'm just sorry I didn't think of it. Uh, but <laughs> she, she reached out and, and there were going to be 50 authors, but it ended up being 45 authors and several wrote two books. But I was one of the authors and I naturally said, what the heck? Yes, I'll write Kansas. That's where I live. And so I wrote uh, Victoria Bride of Kansas. And um, that was book number 34 in 50 books that were released one after the other over the course of however many 50 weeks or so. It was an unprecedented thing. I've never seen anybody do anything like it. It was very cool. It was very fun. It was fun being part of it. I am sure glad I didn't have to lead it. I can't imagine, but I sure enjoyed being part of it. When I wrote the Victoria book, I, was, I just was so excited by the story and enjoyed it so much. I decided, well, I need to write another story with one of these characters and you know, release that too. And I knew Victoria was going to come out close to Christmas. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll write a Christmas story. That's kind of a companion book to this about the, uh, her sister-in-law, basically, the girl who ends up being her sister-in-law. So that those become those two books, The Victoria Bride of Kansas and Santa's Mail Order Bride that were released one after the other. That's really, really awesome. And I have done other books and series with authors. I've done um, the 12 Days of Christmas, Mail Order Brides. Uh, the Drum is the book that I wrote for that. And again, it was this, I wish I could come up with these ideas. My gosh. Uh, Carolyn Lee uh, had this idea to do this 12 Days of Christmas, Mail Order Brides. And each of us would take one of the days of Christmas and uh, she reached out to me and we were talking and, and began to brainstorm. And oh my goodness, I had so much fun with that because we, we, you know, we were like, oh, you know, so if there's 12 days of Christmas and you've got these brides and every day of Christmas and the song, you know, there's these different figures and, you know, we brainstormed ideas for the storyline. It was going to be set in a mining camp in Colorado and it was going to involve these girls that come in and these, you know, guys that have to, you know, have to get married. And, you know, we just had this whole concept created and even came up with ideas like, you know, using Christmas ornaments on the tree. Somebody is mysteriously leaving the ornaments on the tree, you know, every day. Mm, mm -hmm. And you finally find out who it is in the last book. And, and it was so much fun. And we had such a great, excited readership that we continued the, the concept into what we call Brides of Noel. So Noel was the name of the town. And I wrote one more book in that, which is uh, Jolie, A Valentine's Bride. So that kind of came off of the 12 Days series. It became kind of its own thing. And there have been several of us, the 12 authors in that series, that have written books under the Brides of Noel theme. And so, you know, that was fun and I enjoy multi-author projects. I enjoy doing anthologies like Kansas City Story. I did an anthology as a fundraiser called Wild Deadwood Tales. And that was really, um, it, what it was intended to do was I was, I was taking part of a, in a conference every year, Wild Deadwood Reads up in Deadwood. And I just got kind of fascinated and interested in the rodeo and bull riding and got to talking to one of the guys who was on a board of a, of a charity that, that actually helps bull riders out. And most of these young guys, they don't have any insurance and, you know, it's tough when they get hurt and, um, it, it, you know, their families depend on them. They can't work, you know, that's, that's how they earn a living. So we got to talking and I said, gosh, I want to do something for this 
you know, Western Sports Foundation is what they call it. Mm. And uh, I thought, well, you know, we can, we're authors, we can write, you know, so I reached out some other people who I thought might be interested. And uh, we conceived a, a, a series of short stories based in Deadwood, both contemporary and historical and romances and mostly, and some of them not so much. Um, and we just said, hey, let's do this anthology and then we'll use all the proceeds to go toward the Western Sports Foundation. And so that's what we did. Oh, that's really wonderful. Yeah, it was really fun. It was really <laughs> cool. And I, and I was so happy to see the the energy that the authors brought to it, how how willing they were to donate their time and their efforts and even then to help sell it. And so we did that over the course of about a year and, uh, and it was out there and, and we earned some, you know, respectable money for the <laughs> organization and we had a really good time and got to know the guys. And, um, and I, I felt really good about that. I'm, I'm really glad I did that. It was a lot of work, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> That's really great. Yeah. yeah. And one of the other ones that you talked about that I, I really should bring up considering some of the authors within there, uh, the Kansas city story. Oh, yes. Which I'm almost embarrassed to say that, yes, I do have this book, but the only reason I'm embarrassed is because it's still sitting in my collection, my to-be-read file. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, I, I, I haven't opened it since I got it. When And I got it, when I got it, I had my uh, you know, G.A. Edwards, who's the leader of my writing group, and she was the person I bought it from, so she signed it. And I just, you know, it's been sitting on my shelf ever since. But looking back, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. There's Sally Bernathy, a previous guest. Another previous guest is D.L. Rogers, and now you as well. And I have run into several of you at several points. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I could have gotten so many signatures on my book, and I should have been reading this for so long now. I'm going to have to just start get, carrying it with me in my vehicle from now on. So, <laughs> And Kansas well, like story has, a very, has yeah. a very unique story to it. Tell, tell us about this. The good news is none of those stories take very long to read. You could like on a lunch break read one. <laughs> not They're not very long stories. They're, we made sure that they were only about 5,000 words each. But basically the uh, Kansas City story is what it says. It's, it's, it's the history of Kansas City. We, we start at the very beginning, the early days of Kansas City in the 1820s, all the way through the, into the 2000s and um, into the 21st century. And we uh, each took a decade or two and we researched the decade and came up with an idea for a short story based in that decade. Didn't have to be romance. And in fact, only one of the two stories I wrote is a romance. One is a romance, one is not. One is just a, a historical short story based on a true event. And, and actually, both my stories are based on true events with real people. Uh, they just happen to be fictionalized. And so we had a blast because I didn't know a lot of the history of Kansas City until we started researching this book. I knew about the area and I knew about Kansas in general and stuff like that, but I'd never really dug into the history of Kansas City. And I got so fascinated with that history that I have, I have decided I am going to work on a series of some sort that is based in Kansas City. And I was just so fascinated with the history. It's such an interesting city. Oh, that's awesome. I don't know if you knew, but our group, how this kind of got, it was, it was so funny how we came up with the idea to do this. You know, we were like, how, how do we want to make money for our group? You know, so we can have conferences and do blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and somebody said, well, you know, what about a contest? Oh, everybody does contest. Nobody had the energy for that. And then, you know, one of our members came up with the idea of writing a book and each of us submitting a story. And that, you know, we would sell it and use the proceeds. And we were like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So one thing led to another and, and they came up with this idea of, you know, a story for every decade. And, and we, you know, brainstormed together about that. And we brainstormed and, and, you know, collectively came up with the title and uh, the cover and, and, you know, it was really fun. It was real fun working together on that and seeing everybody. There were a number of people who wrote stories for that. Those were debut pieces. That was the first time they were published. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's an amazing looking book. And I mean, it, the cover definitely tells you, it kind of sells what it's about. Uh, and yeah, I, I really need to start diving into it and it's, I, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear from you once you read it. 
I, well, I'm, I'm a big uh, proponent of, for leaving reviews. So I will certainly make sure to uh, leave a review on, on uh, like Amazon and Goodreads and everywhere that it needs to be put up on. So I will certainly do that. <laughs> Yay. You're, you're the kind of reader I love. <laughs> Someone who really leaves reviews. That's marvelous. <laughs> Well, Miss Burke, I'm so thrilled to have had you on here. It's been a wonderful time talking with you. I could just sit here and talk to you for a while. I, I love just diving into your story and, and hearing so much of what you have to offer. And I, I hate having to close it out, but where can people find you? Where can they follow you online? Kind of all over the place. Uh, I am. Uh, I have a website, which is easy to get to, eeburke.com. And Burke is with an E on the end. If people go to my website and sign up for my newsletter, I put a newsletter out about once a month and it, it usually is, oh, it, I call it on the journey and it, it's bits and pieces of research or interesting stories. It's very short. It's meant to be literally read on your phone when you're sitting there, you know, with some time to kill in the doctor's office or something. But it's just, you know, kind of little bits and pieces uh, and, and interesting things about my books. Uh, if you want to know more than just, you know, what's in the book. And then people can follow me on Facebook under E.E. E. Elizabeth Burke on there, author E.E. E. Burke. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. You can find me just about anywhere. So. All right. Wonderful. So, and I will make sure to have links to all of that in the show notes. So that way everybody will know where to go and find your books. And of course there's a nice, wonderful, big list of them on Amazon. If anybody goes there to pick up a copy. So we'll make sure and do that as well. Once again, thank you so much. I'm, this has been a real joy for me getting to talk to you. And, and I was really delighted to have met you and get to sit down and listen to what you had to offer at our workshop. And uh, I really learned a lot. So this was, this was wonderful that I got to talk to you some more afterward. Well, thank you for inviting me to be on the show. I'm excited about sharing the book and talking to you. I can't wait to hear about it. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to step aside. I'm going to hand the floor over to E.E. E. Burke with Taming Huck Finn. So I'm reading from Taming Huck Finn. And first I'm going to read from the back cover so you get a little idea of what the book's about. And then we're going to jump into chapter two. Steamboat pilot Huck Finn lives life on his terms and steers clear of messy entanglements that might tie him down until he takes charge of an orphan boy that needs rescuing. Starched and proper, Miss Hallie McBride is determined to atone for past sins by raising her estranged sister's son. She doesn't expect footloose Mr. Finn to challenge her, much less up and run off with her nephew. Chapter Two The full-throated whistle of a steamboat sent Hallie's pulse racing, despite many years having passed since she stood at the edge of a bluff on the lookout for telltale clouds of smoke. She hadn't come to the river this morning to watch for packets. She was here to find the miserable cur she had to talk to, reason with, bribe, or drown, anything to get Huck Finn to release his claim on her nephew. That humiliating encounter yesterday left her tossing and turning all night. Why had she let the knave taunt her into losing her temper? That would not happen today. This morning, the lawyer, Mr. Dubois, had graciously consented to consider her request if she and Mr. Finn were of one mind. She had some convincing to do, but she was confident she could navigate a conversation with Huck Finn as capably as her father had steered his steamboat on a starless night. Sunlight glinted off the steamer's gilded spreaders, which stretched between towering smokestacks. Twin chimneys spewed pitch black clouds belched from red-eyed boilers that churned day and night until they gave out or blew up. Her anguished gaze flew to the highest deck. Through the open window of the pilot house, a dark figure at the wheel took on an impossible face and form. Her father's boat hadn't ventured into these waters and never would. The grand old side wheeler was gone along with its adventurous captain. They'd planted him beneath the earth in a cemetery near their home. Years later, his wife was laid to rest beside him. In death, Mama had finally gotten her dearest wish, a husband who wouldn't wander. Hallie banished the painful memories. Grief, recrimination, regret, 
Those were feelings that served no purpose, save to remind her of why she was better off unmarried. The stern wheeler approached the landing, bells ringing, then the huge paddle wheel stopped, and a moment later began to turn backwards, pounding the water into a frothy foam, before it halted and moved forward again in a slow lap. Agile roustabouts with chain hawsers snubbed the boat fast. The boom swung a broad stage over the port bow, and a mad scramble ensued as passengers, crew, and freight were unloaded with shouts and curses hot enough to redden even a strumpet's ears. Hallie scrunched her eyes, attempting to see through her spectacles. With a huff, she removed them. The lenses were only helpful for reading or close work, like painting. She left them on because they made her feel less exposed. A flash of white skin appeared amidst the shining dark bodies unloading and loading cargo. Only the poorest white men worked the docks. Perhaps brute labor was the only thing Huck Finn knew how to do. He was easy enough to spot being a head taller than those around him and shamelessly bare from the waist up. An odd fluttering started in her stomach. Nerves. She replaced her spectacles and threaded her way down the path, rehearsing what she planned to say. At the head of the wharf, she stopped, willing to wait, however impatiently, until the last of the freight was loaded and the steamboat was on its way. Fifteen minutes seemed an eternity for someone whose future hung in the balance. As he turned, she waved and called out, Mr. Finn! The surprise on his face quickly transformed into an expression that wasn't hard to read, even through all that hair. He wasn't pleased to see her. She raised her hand again to let him know she wished to speak to him. They must spar off the sandbar they were stuck on, and that wouldn't be accomplished by ignoring the problem. He started in her direction, albeit slowly. Her irritation increased when he made no move to clothe himself. The uncouth fellow obviously went about without a shirt often enough that his skin had taken on the ruddy tan afforded to fair-skinned men. Her corset suddenly felt tight. She replaced her spectacles so she wouldn't see him as clearly, then made her way to a stack of crates where a shirt had been laid aside, along with a vest and coat that looked familiar. Are these yours? If you aren't claiming them. Not a flicker of embarrassment crossed his features. Hallie tossed him the shirt, making it clear she expected him to put it on. As he buttoned it up, perspiration seeped through the light fabric, forming damp circles. Surprisingly, his body didn't have the sharp odor of a man who hadn't bathed in weeks. Rather, he smelled of fresh sweat and warm skin. She fished out a handkerchief tucked beneath her sleeve and dabbed at beads of moisture on her upper lip. The crude fellow found pleasure in flustering her. She would ignore his vulgar state and steam ahead as if nothing were amiss. Are you, do you work the docks? His eyes, a murky shade of blue that reminded her of the shifting colors of the river, registered surprise before he squinted them, deepening fine lines at the edges. Laugh lines, her mother would have called them. More likely it was due to being outside in the sun without a hat. Is that why you're down here, he asked, to make sure I have a job? He'd taken her simple question as a challenge. I don't care whether you have a job. Then how come you asked? He was doing it again, baiting her. Yesterday, she'd made a mistake of letting him put a match to her fuse. Not today. I am attempting to make polite conversation. As you seem disinterested in proper customs, I'll get straight to the point. I came here to speak with you about Thaddeus. Tad, what about him? The neutral expression worn by her opponent made it difficult to divine whether he was irritated or just indifferent. Perhaps she could appeal to his softer side, that is, if he had one. His body could have been hewn from stone. She jerked her gaze upward from his chest to his face as the alarming flutter started up again. Mr. Finn, do you believe your nephew deserves a good home and an education? Don't see as I could argue that. Hallie raced ahead before he changed his mind. Of course, as his uncle, you'd want what's best for him. Mr. Dubois says you'll be leaving soon. He mentioned something about you going to work on a steamboat. I'm sure you'll agree. That isn't the best place for a young boy. If you're concerned about Thaddeus's education, I can assure you he will go to school. And I'm well-versed in literature and the arts and can teach him things a gentleman needs to learn. The annoying fellow didn't answer. 
He might not value what he obviously could not teach. He stuffed the extra length of the shirt into his trousers, as if she weren't standing right there in front of him. The muscles in his shoulders pulled at the fabric as he slid the red suspenders in place. How many boys did you say you'd raised, Miss? McBride, she snapped, irritated that he hadn't bothered to commit her name to memory. That is beside the point. Well, you just said Tad ought to have the best home, so how am I to work it out if I don't have all the facts? The facts are, I looked after my youngest sister and our bedridden mother and ran a household from the time I was 14. I assure you, I am quite capable of caring for a child. His regard turned speculative. That may be, but raising a girl is different from raising a boy. You haven't raised a boy, so you might not know that. The conniving rascal wasn't going to lure her into another argument. Regardless, you must admit I am in a better position than you to provide for Tad. He lifted his eyebrows in a look of surprise. Oh, I didn't reckon we were talking about providing for him. Mr. Dubois says there's a fund set up to be used for his care. Unless you're saying you got no use for the money. Stop twisting my words. This isn't about whether either of us needs his money. Oh, no, I don't need it. You were the one that brung it up. She gripped her reticule with both hands to keep from smacking him. I did not bring up money. I was trying to get you to agree that the most important thing is to give Thaddeus the best home and education. He regarded her with a puzzled expression. Hang it, Miss McBride, but I don't see where there's a problem. I know the boy's got to have a good home and educating. And sure as I'm standing here, I'll be sure that he gets it. Her patience unraveled. How could you possibly give him a home or an education when you have neither? A long silence stretched out, the empty space filled by the crunch of gravel as men trod past, casting curious glances. Hallie's conscience smote her for callously throwing Huck Finn's low situation into his face. Never had she been so deliberately cruel. But he had goaded her into it, and he needed to hear the harsh truth that that's what it took to convince him how foolish and irresponsible it would be to keep Tad with him. I don't recollect saying I would be giving him those things, his even reply belied neither hurt nor shame. You reckon the widow was a good granny? Hallie blinked, confused by the abrupt shift in direction. Mrs. Douglas had a sterling reputation. She would not cast aspersions on that good woman. Likely it was the woman's late husband who had passed along the moral weakness that had shown up in Tad's father a weakness that was difficult to perceive beneath a handsome face and bold spirit. I am sure Mrs. Douglas did the best she could. You agree she wanted the best for Tad? Suspicion raised a red flag. Yes, Hallie drew the word out as her mind raced to catch up. Then you ought to agree she had a good reason not to give him to you in the first place. She didn't know I wanted him. The confession tumbled out before Hallie could stop it with her hand. Emotions bubbled like boiling water rattling a tea kettle. She kept the lid on tight. Huck Finn wouldn't be moved by tears. At any rate, she was too proud to weep in front of him. God forgive her. Had she reached out sooner, Mrs. Douglas wouldn't have given Thaddeus to this insufferable man. If she'd done more to rein in her younger sister's wild nature, things might have turned out differently. She would not fail Caroline's son. Regaining her composure, she spoke in an even voice. If you must know, I was estranged from my sister, something I deeply regret. The least I can do is see to it that my nephew is raised upright. Raised upright, her adversary's face hardened. I recall old Miss Watson tried that on me. She worked hard at it day and night, about wore me out. Miss Watson, who was, wait, Mrs. Douglas had a spinster sister by that name who had lived with her when James was young. He described her as a wizened old witch with a sour disposition. Hallie swelled with indignation. Are you comparing me to a grouchy old maid? Mr. Finn, the awful man, held his tongue, but the look on his face confirmed it. She fisted her hands at her sides, barely restraining an urge to shove him off the dock. I refuse to be drawn into a pointless exchange of insults. Didn't you say you want Thaddeus to have a good home? You've as much as admitted that you cannot provide that. I said I'd see to it that he has those things. 
by putting him with the right family, one that knows how to raise up a boy without pecking at him and suffocating him and making his life so miserable he wished he was anywhere else. Rude did not begin to describe Huck Finn. He was cruel and hateful. How can you think that I am the kind of person who would torment a child? I wish to raise my nephew to be a man of honor. You want to turn him over to strangers. Who said anything about giving him to strangers? Her frustration boiled into a fury. She raised her fist. I'll fight you, Mr. Finn, in court, in the street if I have to, but I won't let you give him away. He belongs with his family. He belongs with me. Scene break. Tad peeked around the edge of the counter at the hotel lobby. It was hard waiting until nobody was looking, but he didn't want to get caught. While Mr. Dubois and another man were talking to the clerk, he raced out the front door. He skidded on the boards and ran down the hill, dodging men's legs and women's skirts, aiming to get back to the river. That would be where he'd find his uncle, just like he had yesterday. After they'd all come back to the hotel, Uncle Huck had told him to stay with Mr. Dubois until the grown-ups worked things out. Tad hadn't seen his uncle earlier this morning, but he'd noticed Aunt Hallie sneaking around. She might be hoping to catch him. Leaving things to the grown-ups wasn't such a good idea. He slowed to a walk when he got closer to the docks. Men loading crates with nets on big hoists shouted to each other and seemed not to notice two boys playing chase around one of the thick ropes tethering the steamboat. Tad envied those boys. He had never been allowed to play at the landing back home. He shaded his eyes and looked up at the pilot house high above it all. Wouldn't it be something to steer one of the big boats down the river? His Grammy had told him they wouldn't let him pilot a steamboat if he didn't go to school. He wasn't sure he believed her. Grown-ups preached against lying, but they didn't mind stretching the truth. Like the time Granny told him he had an aunt who was too afraid to cross the river to come see him. Aunt Allie didn't look like she was afraid of anything. In fact, she had scared him with her black dress and glinting glasses and all that talk about getting on a train and taking him home with her. That's why he told her he didn't have an aunt because he didn't care to have one if she planned to take him away from his uncle. Uncle Huck wouldn't let her. He promised. Tad wandered away from the big steamers down to a second pier with smaller boats. Uncle Huck might have a raft down there somewhere. He had lived on one when he was younger. Tad could recite every story he'd been told about Huck Finn and wanted more than anything to go off and explore the world with his famous uncle. Once he found him, they could run away and leave Aunt Hallie behind. Scene break. Later that afternoon, Huck stood in front of the hotel, straightening his coat for the umpteenth time while he debated about going inside. He'd received a visit from the lawyer about an hour after Miss McBride had left in a huff. She'd mistook him for a rouster because she'd seen him helping a friend unload a boat and had filled the lawyer in on her misperceptions. Dubois made a tentative suggestion to allow Tad's aunt to raise him if her story checked out and had proposed a meeting to discuss what he called final arrangements. Made it sound like they were planning a funeral, and they might as well be, far as poor Tad was concerned. With a sigh, Hutt plopped down on the bench next to the door. Now that he was here for the meeting, wasn't sure what to do. Miss McBride only seemed to want Tad because she felt obligated to her dead sister. That weren't a bad reason, but it wasn't good enough either. Huck had made Tad a promise, and the boy most certainly did not want to go with his aunt. Who would, considering what she had in mind? She'd stated her intentions in nice words, but even a well-meaning old maid would make the boy's life a misery. Removing his hat, Huck threaded his fingers through his damp hair. Would Miss McBride be happier now that he'd bathed? He'd noticed her staring at him. She'd die before she confessed to being fascinated with his bare chest. The spinster squelched her own desires and would make a boy feel guilty about having normal hungers. If not Miss McBride, then who? He couldn't take Tad. He was a wanderer. Soon he'd head up north to the rocky part of the river. From there he might trek west, clear to the ocean if that's what it took to cure this gnawing restlessness. Miss McBride had been right in saying he had no business raising a child, though he'd eat dirt before admitting as much to her face. She'd remarked on how he didn't have a home or an education. Well, he didn't need either. He'd gotten along this far without it, though he'd be the first to say a boy deserved better. 
As a child, he had wished for a good family and a pa that cared about him and could guide him. He'd like to help Tad find that kind of family, but how would he recognize such a thing, even if he saw it? Then he'd have to convince Tad to go along and wrestle Miss McBride, who'd threatened to grapple with him in a street brawl. Now that was an interesting notion. He could just imagine the startled expression in those grass green eyes when he pressed her down beneath him. Huck shot to his feet, alarmed by the provocative image that had popped into his head. Devil take you, Huckleberry. You've gone plumb crazy if you're thinking about doing that with a snappish biddy. He jerked his coat into place with a sharp reminder that he didn't care for skinny women. His tastes ran more to soft and curvy and good-natured. No longer uncertain, Huck strode inside. He couldn't in good conscience let that overbearing woman get her claws on the boy. In the lobby, he spotted the object of his cussed daydream in deep discussion with Dubois. A small crease between her brows marred her smooth skin, and the shapeless dress did nothing to enhance her complexion or her figure. She clutched a dark bonnet in one hand like she was set to use the long ribbons to whip the lawyer into submission. Rebellious black curls poked out of a net she'd used to imprison them. Heck, even her hair wanted to get away. Huck released a harsh breath. What had possessed him to entertain low thoughts about a woman who undoubtedly undressed in the dark to keep from blushing? As he approached, he picked up a thread of strain in her voice. We must alert the authorities. Huck pasted on a smile. I'm here. No need to set the dogs on me. She goggled at him like his head had turned into a pumpkin. What are you talking about? We weren't discussing you. Thaddeus has run away. What's this? Huck looked to Dubois for confirmation. The lawyer removed his hat and held the brim in both hands. His balding crown glistened with sweat. When Tad left the room, he told me he was going to visit the staff. He's a very sociable child, and I thought nothing of it. But I haven't been able to find him for the past two hours. It appears he's run off. Huck rubbed at his chest a spell before he realized the achy feeling was worry. He'd never had cause to fret over a child before and didn't much like it. One more reason he had no business keeping Tad. Don't you reckon he's just hiding? We checked all over. Miss McBride wrung her hands. She might not be the best person to raise Tad, but it was clear enough she was worried sick over him. Huck had half a mind to put his arms around her and offer reassurance. He resisted the mad notion. Worried or not, she was pricklier than a cactus. What about the levee, he suggested. Boys can't stay away from the river. The river? Horror darkened her eyes. Dear Lord, I'll fetch the sheriff or constable, someone who can round up more people for a more thorough search. She rushed out the door without waiting for agreement. He'd meant to ease her fears, not make them worse. Tad was fine, probably hiding in the hotel somewhere. But what if the boy had ventured near the water? That fierce current would sweep him away and nothing flat. What do you recommend, Mr. Finn? The lawyer's grim expression set off dark and awful images. Uh, you stay here in case he comes back. I'll go check the wharf. Huck shot out the door and set out at a dead run, setting up every prayer he could call to mind. Providence might listen on account of his pleading for the life of a little boy and not an old sinner like himself. When he reached the docks, he made a quick search and even checked his room above the freight house. He asked around. A couple of the rousters said they'd noticed a boy matching Tad's description. They didn't know where he'd gone. What if the little fellow had gotten stuck somewhere and couldn't get out? Or somebody had snatched him? Huck shuddered at the memory of being locked up in an isolated cabin for weeks on end with his crazy drunk pap. He'd nearly chewed off his arm he was so desperate to escape. He came to an abrupt halt, arrested by the side of a familiar flat bottom boat tied at the end of the pier. Durned if he weren't the stupidest man alive. The old trapper's keel boat. It would make a perfect hiding spot. Any boy worth his salt couldn't resist the temptation. In two shakes, he was there, stepping onto the wide platform that bobbed beneath his weight. The simple craft had been constructed without the usual wooden shack. Instead, the trapper had built himself a shelter out of saplings and buffalo hides, a teepee. Holding his breath, Huck pulled back the flap. Inside, Tad lay curled up on a bearskin rug, his face free of worry, enjoying the peaceful slumber of the just and righteous. Relieved and annoyed at the same time, Huck removed his hat and mopped his forehead with a shirt sleeve. 
He ducked inside and sat cross-legged beside the child, who didn't wake up until he was given a gentle shake. Uncle Huck, Tad murmured, blinking sleepily. He sat up, gaping and stretching, like he didn't have a care in the world. For a brief moment, Huck considered drawing the boy over his lap for a good cow hiding. Wasn't no more than Tad deserved for scaring everybody out of their wits. Only, he'd been thrashed so many times, he'd forsworn lifting his hand against anyone smaller or weaker, and it wouldn't do any good to rip out at the boy, so he scowled instead. You can't just run off whenever you take a mind to. You're not mad at me, are you? I heard about that time you lived on a raft, so I thought you might be here, and I was waiting for you to get back. I want to live on a raft with you. Tad's gaze reminded Huck of a hopeful puppy. A dangerous feeling crept over him. The same sort of gladness he felt all those years ago when he had seen Jim on that island and had realized he wasn't alone. Oh, no, he argued with that soft part of himself. You got no business even considering taking this boy just because you're feeling lonely. Getting angry or weakening, he took a stern tone. This isn't a raft, it's a flatboat, and it's not mine. Now let's get you back to Mr. Dubois. Tad's expression crumbled. But you got to take responsibility for me. That's what he said. I am taking responsibility. I'm going to find you a good family. His nephew's eyes grew. Are you sending me with Aunt Hallie? Uck hesitated, unsure how to answer. He didn't cotton to the idea of that woman raising Tad, but he had no right to poison the boy against her. You want to go with your Aunt Hallie? Tad scrunched his nose. No, I don't know her. You don't know me neither. Well, sure seems like I know you because Granny used to talk about you all the time. And Mr. Sawyer tells me stories. He told me about you and him being pirates and living on a raft and setting that slave free. The longer Tad went on, the larger the tales became. It was clear Tom Sawyer had supplied most of them. He was nuts about enlarging stories and had done it up elegant in a way Huck couldn't begin to match, not being brought up to that kind of style. I did some of those things, Huck admitted. Mostly we pretended. You don't need to live on a raft to do that. The boy inched over like he wanted to cuddle, but wasn't about to own up to needing it. Huck awkwardly rested his arm behind the small form that smelled vaguely of dirt and wet wool. He had no idea how to comfort a child, all the more reason he couldn't keep this one. Were you a soldier in the war, Uncle Huck? What had sparked that question? It had been five years since the war between the states had ended, and Tad was too young to remember it. Maybe it was just one of those curious questions boys asked. Huck pondered how to respond. Truth was, he hadn't been able to bring himself to fight beside his friends for a cause he didn't believe in. Yet he hadn't been willing to pick up a gun against them. Either decision would have torn him apart, so he'd lit out and gone west and had risked being labeled a coward by those whose opinions shouldn't matter but this wasn't a conversation he wanted to have with an eight-year-old. No, I didn't fight in the war. I didn't much care for following orders. That was true enough. He had little use for authority. Men abused power the moment they got a taste of it. Tad snuggled closer. My papa was a soldier. He was a captain and he was brave. Rode right into the fray with bullets whizzing all around. That sounded like something else Tom Sawyer would have said. And maybe he had, with the way the boy was parroting it. Riding into a fray of bullets didn't sound brave as much as stupid, but Huck didn't correct his nephew's notions. Who was he to define courage? At the first sign of danger, he'd duck, or run. Sounds like your pap was a real brash fella, and smart too. I'm sure he'd want you to go live with folks like him and your ma. He wouldn't want you running off by yourself. But I'm not by myself. I'm with you. Huck grappled with the weaker man inside. In some ways, Tad reminded him of the boy he'd once been, lonely and eager to befriend someone he thought might care for him. The old yearning kindled an enticing image. He snuffed it out. He had no skills for parenting and no wish to be tied down. No, I can't keep you. There's no profit in it for either of us. But you said I didn't have to go with nobody I didn't want to. You said so, Uncle Huck. Tears welled in the boy's big brown eyes. Don't cry. Taint manly. Huck blinked at the stinging in his own eyes. That was one thing Pap hadn't been able to beat out of him, unfortunately. 
He was too soft for his own good. Tad snuffled and reached into his coat pocket. I want to show you something. He pulled out a small leather bag and loosed the strings that held it shut. After digging around inside, he held up a coin. Old gold, by the look of it. Where'd you get that? Huck took it to examine it. Mr. Sawyer gave it to me before I left. He said I should show it to you and remind you about your treasure. Huck smiled as he turned the gold coin over in his fingers. This must be from Injun Joe's gold. Me and Tom dug it up. Six thousand dollars a piece. Money that would have come in right handy if it hadn't come with so many strings. Huck had turned the fortune over to Judge Thatcher and had washed his hands of the troubles that came with prosperity. Ironically, years later, he hadn't been able to resist the gold fever and had learned his lesson the hard way. Riches, like love, was something he couldn't hold on to. He wasn't meant to be wealthy or loved. The lack of money and entanglement suited him just fine. Less to lose. Mr. Sawyer told me that story about the treasure and being in the cave. It sounded ever so fine, like all of them other treasures. Tad heaved a wishful sigh. You can keep that doubloon. Huck slipped it back into the bag. No, you keep it safe. Tad's little face brightened right up. Oh, it'll be safe in here. This is where I keep all my important stuff. I got a tooth, a feather, and a marble, and here's a frog. He's all dried up. Tad poured the bag's contents into his palm. Besides the gold coin, it was just a collection of odds and ends that would only be dear to a boy. I climbed a tree and got this out of the nest. Tad held up a piece of blue eggshell. Robins, I wager, and I caught a spider, Huck recalled, an old superstition. You didn't kill it, did you? That's bad luck. The boy's eyes grew wide. No, I didn't kill it, only played with it for a little while, and then let it go. That's all right. If it was crawling on you, it's a sign something good will happen. Oh, I know that's true, because I found it on my shoulder the day before we found you a knot lodged in Huck's throat. Nobody had ever looked at him with such worshipful awe. Well, maybe a dog once, but that didn't count for a human. We got to get back, he said gruffly. Tad scrunched his face. But I don't want to go back. I want to stay with you. Huck fought the pull of heartstrings. He couldn't keep Tad. A boy wasn't a pet. Don't you want to live somewhere you got your own bed with a ma who will feed you regular and take care of you? You wouldn't have that with me. The child's tears welled up. What does it matter if I can't have fun? Granny never let me be a pirate or find my own treasure. I want adventures like you had. Living ain't really living less than you enjoy it. That's what Mr. Sawyer says. What else had Tom said? He spun a story for just about everything. Made even crazy sound reasonable. That must be why he was a lawyer. Huck jolted up as an idea popped onto him. By golly, it was brilliant, even for him. His old friend had married and settled down, and based on the letter he'd written, had a yin for more children. It was obvious he and Tad had formed an attachment. Tom could give the boy everything he needed and make sure his life was filled with just enough adventure to keep him satisfied. Why, it was just the thing, if Tad could be convinced, and Miss McBride could be kept from stirring up trouble. Huck smiled down at his charge. Reckon I could take you on one adventure, if you'll agree to go with the family I pick out for you. Tad's lip curled out. You said I don't got to go with nobody I don't want to. Oh, I promise you'll like the folks I got in mind. And I'll tell you who it is soon as I work things out. Huck patted the boy's shoulder. Might take a little wrangling, but hadn't he helped Jim escape a life of bondage? How could he do less for his own nephew? Tad chewed his lip. The inner struggle played itself out in his eyes. At last, he gave a sigh and a reluctant nod. All right, good. Huck started to offer his hand, then hesitated. A simple handshake might not carry enough weight to prevent Tad from changing his mind later. Let's swear to it like me and Tom did when we were kids. He didn't much like the idea of cutting the child's finger for a blood oath, so he spit on his palm instead. Tad did the same, and they shook. The boy's dark eyes sparkled with delight. Are we going to ride this raft? How about a steamboat? That would make the trip back home faster if they could find one headed in the right direction. Tad appeared to be tempted by the idea. 
Hmm, maybe later. Right now I want to ride a raft. Tain a raft, Tad. It's a flat boat. But we can pretend it's a raft. The hopeful appeal struck a chord deep inside Huck. It had been a long time since he'd lived so free and easy as he had those days he'd spent floating down a wide, smooth river with a friend. A quiet whisper said it weren't a good idea, but a louder voice, the one he most often heeded, insisted this might work to his advantage. If he took Tad on a brief adventure using this boat, it meant he didn't have to deal with that tiresome woman. She might follow them on to a steamboat, but she'd never get on a flatboat. He'd just go find Dubois, explain what they were doing, and ask him to work things out for Tom Sawyer to adopt the boy. Then he'd slide off a little ways down river, board a steamer, and have Tad settled in with his new family before Miss McBride realized what was happening. With a little luck, he could make his way back to Atchison by late summer, in plenty of time to reach the upper river before water levels dropped too low to navigate. He lowered his voice to a conspiring level. Look here, this is what we'll do. I know the old trapper that owns this flatboat. He won't be needing it, so we'll just borrow it for a spell. Tad leapt up and threw his arms around Huck's neck. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're the best uncle in the whole world, and I won't never forget it till I rot. Touched by the child's gratitude, Huck patted Tad's back. He was beginning not to mind the hug so much. Let me fetch some trifles and talk to Mr. Dubois so he won't be in a sweat over what happened to you. Huck crawled out of the tent. The sight and sound of a rushing river sent excitement thrumming through his veins. He'd made the right decision, felt it clear to his bones. He would give his nephew a taste of freedom before Tad had to go back to being at least partway respectable. Every boy deserved time on a river. Mr. Finn, what are you doing there? Huck jerked his head up in alarm. That voice could belong to only one person, and here she came, flying down to the landing. It flashed through his mind that Miss McBride didn't remind him so much of a crow as a chicken hawk sighting its prey. Her determined steps kicked her skirts out behind her, and the inky strands of hair whipped across her face as she drew closer to where the flatboat was docked. Get off that boat this instant, she commanded, using a tone that would have done a riverboat pilot proud. Huck stiffened before he realized she was talking to Tad, who had crawled out behind him. They'd just have to find another way to get shy of her. He got to his feet. Hold on now, Miss McBride. We were just coming back to tell you. The boat lurched, pitching Huck to the floor. What the? He looked around and his heart nearly stopped. Tad had untied the ropes, holding the boat to the posts, and was now trying to man the massive oar and steer them into the channel. With a curse, Huck dashed to the stern, snatching the boy off the steersman's box before Tad lost his balance and toppled into the rushing water. Sit, Huck ordered. Tad flopped down just as the current snatched the light boat and carried it away from the wharf. Mr. Finn, stop! Throwing Miss McBride the ropes was useless. The momentum would drag her into the water. Huck gripped the tiller and lowered the oar. You must stop! Her voice pitched up another octave. Huck spared the woman barely a glance as he fought to right the boat so it wouldn't spin out of control or strike debris carried along by the swift current. With the water running this fiercely, he'd never be able to pole to shore. He'd have to take them downriver a few miles and find a safer spot to land. Their adventure would be starting slightly ahead of schedule. After gaining control of the boat, he looked back at the wharf. The confounded woman had hauled her skirts up and was running along the dock. Couldn't she see the boat was too far away for her to catch up? Stay back, he yelled. I'll take care of him. Tad danced from one foot to the other and waved his hands. Hey, Aunt Hallie, guess what? We're going a rafting. Her startled expression changed to one of horror. She reached the end of the pier. The blamed woman had to stop, but it was Huck's heart that halted when she flung herself into the air. Her black dress flapped like wings as she took flight for less than a second before dropping like a stone into the river. And that was E.E. E. Burke reading an amazing chapter from her latest book, Taming Huck Finn. I'm just blown away 
It's like I was talking during the interview. I just read Huck Finn a few months before, so I felt like like she really captures the whole essence. So don't forget to click in the show notes so you can follow E. E. Burke and pick up a copy of this book for yourself. I highly recommend it. Don't forget to also click the links for our friends and sponsors. And as always, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss that next week when we come back with a new author, a new book, and a new sample chapter. Take care, everyone. We'll see you again real soon.